Hi, Maurice. Hi, Thorsten. Good, Good to see you. Good to see you too. <laughs> So my name is Marie Schneider and I'm Thorsten Schmidt, the CEO of Sirius Yachts. And the reason I'm here today is because I went cruising about five years ago and I saw a lot of interesting boats and I always thought about what would be the perfect boat to go cruising with. And after looking around and seeing many different boats, I decided that for me, the Sirius 35 DS was the perfect boat. I did a little video about that at the Dusseldorf Boat Show this year and Thorsten and I got talking after that and he said, well, why don't you come over and we can have a sail together instead of just, you know, you seeing the boat on the heart. So yeah, that's why I'm here. Yeah, and thanks to the customer lending us this boat, um, uh, we have a beautiful day. Let's go sailing. Yeah, great. While Torsten and I prepare the boat for leaving the marina, let me just give you a quick idea of what my sailing expertise is. At the age of 26, I bought a boat and sailed her from the Netherlands down to the Canary Islands, to the Caribbean, up to the Bahamas, along the East Coast and sold her in the Chesapeake Bay. Since then, sailing has become my life and I make a living helping people to fulfill their sailing and cruising dreams. Then, it's my turn to maneuver her out of her slip. I usually hate this part and I think I'm terrible at it. But it works out pretty neatly this time and Torsten assures me that I did good. Even going backwards is pretty okay and I couldn't really tell that there were two keels instead of one. Of course, there wasn't a lot of wind, which was just as well for me. This is, after all, the most valuable boat that I have ever docked. So yeah, there was some pressure. But anyhow, off we go, the Baltic Sea is calling. We intend to take her out sailing and see how she behaves, though I fear that there won't be enough wind today to test her seaworthiness and performance in heavy weather. So how about it? Should we set the sails? Absolutely. How are we gonna do this? Do you think I could do it single-handedly? Absolutely, the whole boat is set up for single-hand sailing. Okay, cool. Um, just give it a try, we have a good autopilot. Yeah, so I'm gonna turn it into the wind first and then Okay, so now I just, yep. well, of course I loosen this and then, which one is it? This one. Thorsten is wondering by now why on earth I'm doing all that manual labor when there's an electric winch right in front of me. It's an electric winch, so don't make it too hard on yourself. <laughs> You're right, I'm gonna be lazy today. Truth is, I simply forgot that it was there. I am not used to this kind of luxury. That's what it is, a true luxury. I'm all for luxury, as long as you can do without it, if need be. As for the boat, the sail area isn't too big, so I would easily be able to handle all the sails manually and single-handedly, which is great to know. It just gives me that safe feeling, knowing I can handle the boat if, say, the electronics should fail. Now that the main is up, next comes the Genoa. The Furler too has an electric motor. The motor is almost silent, so at first it's hard for me to notice that the sail is actually unfurling. Now that the sails are up and we leave the harbour walls behind us, the wind picks up a little. Torsten shows me the ins and outs of the boat and I get a chance to check out everything she has to offer. But the wind dies again, so time for some boat talk. We talk not only of the 35DS, but also about sailing in general and my time as a liveaboard. You know what I really love about this boat is the fact that everything is so close together. I mean, you have the steering wheel right here, all the controls up here, engine controls, the autopilot, the winches, the cleats, everything is really close. And also, I mean, check this out, right? 
you can do this and then you can sit up here for example and you can see above the roof and you just have a wonderful view and how on earth did you get this idea? Well, that wasn't our idea. Actually, as many of these things here, it comes from owners, it comes from, from research. And this is actually Jeffa Steering, they're worldwide leaders in, in steering systems. And I think it's, it's bloody fantastic because you have all these crazy boats with two wheels. I'm always wondering when you will see three wheels on the boat. Yeah. <laughs> and and this, is just, this is just if you're harboring, you have only the small wheel, not this huge one, yeah. uh, which is a blockage in the cockpit and you can't step by. Here you can very easily um, and very fast step by, but then I, uh, you, you sit there, I sit down here because I can actually fantastically see under the sails and into my telltales and can just have, can just enjoy sailing. And I mean, the view is so good on the outside as well, but you can also look through the deck saloon and, and see through the windows there and have a pretty good view also, which mm. is nice. So it feels like a all round view basically, even though there's this big thing in the middle. And it's not that high. It's not as high as a, as a typical spray head. So if you stand up, um, the roof is only 1.35 meters on a uh -huh. 35. So literally everybody can, can look over it. Yeah. While leaving the harbor, I sometimes had to, you know, step on my toes to really be able to see the bow. But that's because I'm very short. So, <laughs> and I can also stand on this and yes. then I'm totally safe. So that's a little block. And um, uh, well, all our boats are made to measure. We have one couple um, where, where both are not very tall yeah. and, and we made that a bit higher and a bit wider. Okay. <laughs> but you can always stand up there because with a cutting wheel. Yeah, of can, course, you can, you can bring, you can the, do bring that the wheel over to where and your perfect sort of steer like this. And, yeah. yeah. If you really need a mm -hmm. full overview of everything. Yeah. Let's leave the cockpit for now and move to the deck. If you're doing offshore sailing, you want a safe deck with a sturdy guardrail, jack stays you can use to securely get to the bow, and high tow rails. As a liverboard, you want to be able to use the deck as an additional living space to sit, lie around, or do yoga. You can check all the boxes for this boat, but that's not all that's important. A big topic if you're going cruising is, of course, energy, right? <laughs> Filling <Yeah>. your batteries. <laughs> um, so what are the options that you usually sell to people who are going to sail around the world or, well, sail places, let's say? <laughs> well, generally, I would say on modern cruising boats, we don't have energy problems anymore that, that big like that was in the past. Um, that's also because we have lots of sources, um, for example, solar panels like you can see here or on the cockpit arch, then we have wind, um, that might be a water generator. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, then there are fuel power generators, but it's also down to battery technique yeah. um, that had improved over the last years a lot. Um, it's what they are the standard classical um, uh, batteries like uh, AGM and, and JL powered batteries. Mm -hmm. But then also there is uh, lithium ion and, and, and yeah. lots of advanced technique there. So there are customers who want to have the newest technique on board and, and uh, they are manageable. Uh, but then there is also remote places in the world where you can't get help for everything that easy or replacements for everything that easy and having something which you can at least um, replace with something standard classical in the system is, is, is easier then. So was energy a problem on, on when you were on tour with Lisa? Uh, it was a bit of a problem. We only had a 100 watt uh, solar panel. Uh, on the guardrail right here, but at least you could tilt it, you know, towards yep. the sun. So it was pretty efficient. And then we also had a wind generator, mm -hmm. which was so noisy that um, we had the whole anchorage to ourselves, which <laughs> is a plus, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Nobody wants to be near to you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, most of the time it wasn't a problem, but uh, on long passages, you know, when you had the GPS, plotter, VHF, fridge and everything on 24-7, yeah. then, you know, we sometimes had to use the engine to... Yeah. yeah. Did you have any alternative source, like a small generator? No, nothing. Or, um, how, how big was the battery capacity? Uh, only 220 amp hours. Okay. Plus the starter. Yeah. 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 So yeah. Well, there's not always sun and there's not always wind. So yeah. to have some have a have a, have a bit bigger battery bank is, is definitely a plus. Yeah, absolutely. There, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Makes total sense. <laughs> more but battery power and and more well sources for energy yeah. generation. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. 
Well, we occasionally have the um, the, the watt and see um, hydro mm -hmm. generators on a boat. Um, well, I see that as, as a bit of an add-on if you really go for everything. I think the main thing is solar, yeah. solar, and then and wind. Of course, there are different types. Yeah. Of those, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I personally think that more solar is is a good option. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Watt and Sea generator is probably quite good too, but you need some decent speeds. And yep. if you have a slow boat, I'm not mm -hmm. saying that this is a slow boat, <laughs> um, but you know, it only really starts generating a lot of energy at six yep. plus knots. And as a cruiser, I mean, you only spend about 20% of the time at sea. So. Yep, yep, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> and the rest at fun anchorages. So. Yeah, <laughs> and preferably in the sun. Yeah, <laughs> true. So, I mean, speaking about energy, <laughs> energy generation and so on, of course, it's even handier if you don't need that much energy. So, you know, do you, for example, do you install a lot of uh, wind vanes? The discussion we have with the customers is um, which route do you want to take? And, you know, for just going once over the Atlantic, there's a lot of stuff which you actually don't need because you can do that with a normal um, uh, with a normal electric powered autopilot and, and you don't need extra tanks and then all that because this is only a one off three week stuff. But if you then want to go further or you want to develop more often, then of course you'll need some serious things and a hydrovane wind steering or any kind of wind steering is a good thing. Yeah, I agree. Um, and the point is, yes, you have a lot of comfort stuff on board today. You know, you know, we do boats with dishwashers and washing machines and all that stuff. But the real point, um, not only for the environment, but also for for, for well, enjoying a long cruise is also thinking about p possibilities not to consume that much energy. Mm -hmm. For me, it's um, going through the Panama Canal and then out in the Pacific, where you have to think about um, water collection, um, uh, certainly wind vane steering, uh, maybe water maker, all stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think if you're going into the Pacific, you definitely need a water maker. And I personally, would only go across the Atlantic with a wind steering and an electric autopilot. Yeah. But just because I would want a backup. Well, if you have a hydromain or something with an own rudder, yeah. you also have a security in a second. Yeah, having like a second, a repl um, emergency rudder. Having, which a second, is, yeah. having a second rudder down. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Hmm? yeah, for sure. You had one on your boat? Uh, yeah, yeah. But um, not with a real rudder, just yeah. a servo rudder. It was and linked. It was linked to the steering. Linked wheel. to the steering, yeah. Yep. You know, lines coming into the cockpit yep. and yep. going on the steering wheel. It's not that easy on a center cockpit, is it? No, it's not. <laughs> 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 That's yes. true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, if you know, if if customers come up to you and they say, "Well, we want to circumnavigate or, or go cruising," how do you advise them? Um, about the right equipment, uh, do some of them have a pretty good idea of what they want and some don't, or how, how does this work? Mm. Well, of course that differs because this is very individual. <laughs> and, uh, and then you also have to know it's not, it's not everybody is, is from, from Europe and starting from here. There are a lot of people in Asia, well, we have 28 different countries now. And, uh, and they might start in the Pacific and not go there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, just one customer on the way to an Indian Ocean and next week we get somebody who is from, from uh, Réunion and, um, and wants to sail Madagascar and all that. So they have all different requirements. And yes, of course, they have also different experiences. Mm -hmm. So what we usually do is um, uh, we are not asking them how they want to have their boat specified, but first of all, we want to learn what's sailing for them and, and what's the area they want to cruise. And we want to learn about their experience, um, what boats they had before and, and what they have in mind. And then, of course, this is also on a timeline. You have people who have a pretty good idea what they want to do in the next two years. Mm -hmm. um, but then there's often a, another agenda for in five years or 10 years. So what we do a lot is um, we, we try to check out how clear they are about what they want to do now and and in the near future um, and uh, and then we try to advise them on things which they don't need at the beginning so if somebody wants to cruise the baltic or, or even in many places in the met you don't need a water maker and you don't need a wind vane and um, uh, yes you need solar panels and a lot of things but you might if if people say well but then in three years we want to go atlantic and pacific and on, um, then it makes sense to build the things directly in. 
Um, if it's a longer plan, it doesn't make sense to buy a water maker, buy them, buy it in five years or in eight years and get the newest technique. Um, but we can prepare a lot of things. Some mm -hmm. things are absolutely easy um, uh, and you don't need any preparation because it's easy accessible. But then there are things which need some built-in shelves or some pipe work through the boat, uh, which doesn't cost a lot of money, but it's much, much easier to do that in the building process. So like a water maker generator, that would probably be easiest while the boat is still in the yard, right? But of course with the water maker, if you don't use it for a long time, it, it can break. So yeah. you don't want to put it in too early. Yeah. And technic, technic really goes on. Yeah. And then you have a lot of people who start, who have big blind plans in mind, but are not 100% sure. And then they start usually, if they are local here, they would usually do a cruise on the Baltic. And most people who think, oh, well, let's do a year in the Baltic, they stay for a number of years. Mm -hmm. And then they go down to the Met and stay a number of years there. And sometimes they just fell in love with Greece or Turkey or whatever and stay there forever. So it doesn't make sense to sell everything to everybody. I guess if you are on a world cruise, you meet a lot of people who always have an agenda of things to retrofit and um, and you probably always have an agenda of things which yeah which is the next step to do <laughs> depending on the budget and you know and the boat. <laughs> yeah and the boat and so on yeah of course i mean you always there's always more you can do and add stuff to your boat and so mm. on i mean mm. the list never ends but i guess at some point you just have to you know get going and yeah. no matter what kind of equipment you have i think you can sail around the world with almost any boat, but so, yeah. it might not be comfortable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> <laughs> so what was the what was the best feature you had on board? What was the best investment you made? What's what's the what's the thing you will never go without? Wind steering. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> For me, that's an like that's the winner. Absolutely. Yeah. It just. For me, I don't know, it, it steers so much better than an electric autopilot. It doesn't need, take any energy. Um, yeah. I'm not, I'm not that convinced that it steers so much better than an electric autopilot <laughs> because they are pretty advanced and have a lot of sensoric in it today. Maybe that was just because but we had an old autopilot. <laughs> <laughs> but then, of course, the energy saving is, is a big thing and yeah. maybe the additional rudder. Yeah, and it's silent security. also, yeah. which which is always a plus. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. so that was that was one of the best investments. And then also, we um, bought a fortress anchor. Yeah, somewhere in Antigua, mm -hmm. because before we had a Bruce anchor, and that just for some reason didn't hold ever mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. Enough technical talk for now. Let's get back to the 35DS. I'm really interested to see how living on her would feel like. What I immediately noticed when we came in here was that there was, well, basically not really even a step, right? This is almost the same level. It's just the washboard yeah. you're stepping over here. Yeah. Yeah. And we're actually in a deck saloon now, which is the main feature of this boat. And um, uh, we have the settee, the galley and the interior steering inside here. And it's so amazing because all these things are, you know, at eye level. So if somebody is in the galley, you can speak to them while you're working on a chart plotter. And all the while, you can look outside and you won't get seasick, which is really nice. <laughs> because usually on other boats, you know, you, you go down the companion way, which is m more like a ladder in some cases, especially if you have a center cockpit, you know, it's quite steep. You go down there and even after a couple of minutes, you end up being seasick. For me, it's, it's always important, especially if you're in, in, in rough seas, um, you have a chance to see what's going to happen. You're not blindfolded inside and don't see what the surrounding is and don't see the wave coming. If, if that's important for you and, and you're in here, you can, you can actually see what's going to happen in the next moment. And it's a bit easier to judge the movement of the boat and to brace yourself in, in the right moment. Or you just sit there relaxed and, <laughs> and or safe or, or in the Hemsman seat here. Yeah. Hmm. That's true. And also, I mean, it's really handy if you, if it's your night watch time and you can just basically lie down here, wait for the 20 minutes or whatever to pass while you're sleeping. And then you just sit up, look around, lie back down, go back to sleep. Yeah. Yeah. It's a lee cloth lying under there so you can make it safe yeah. while on passage. 
hours night watch for you so one was sleeping and the other one was... one was sleeping yeah and the other one was you know got up every 20 minutes or so mm -hmm. really depending on where you are in the english channel well, you basically don't get any sleep um, <laughs> on the atlantic you get about uh, 20 or maybe even 30 minutes at a time um, and then we would either sleep down in the saloon and just go up or when the weather was sort of calm and we knew that there were no waves going over the boat we would actually both sleep in the aft cabin and then just open up the hatch look around and go back in <laughs> <laughs> like a submarine <laughs> yeah <laughs> okay. exactly but i mean this is this is a lot more comfortable because I mean, of course, you see much more than if you open up a hatch in the aft cabin and try to see through the spray hood. If you cruise the world, you want to see something of it. And, and wherever you are, literally whatever you're doing, if, you, if you're just sitting there and relaxing and reading, you can see the world go by. Um, if you do some, some cooking, if you do some passage planning, you can still see what's going to happen. You are still connected to the crew in the cockpit. You see if help is needed. And, um, and literally, even if, you, if you're tall um, uh, you can, and, and, and the weather is not nice and you have the hatch closed, you can still easily um, uh, go in and out and or close the door behind you and have mm -hmm. the elements outside. Yeah, that's very handy and can give you some psychological peace if you don't hear all the noise going on outside and you're just inside and it just feels like a lot less wind sometimes, right? It, it certainly does, yeah. yeah. We do a lot of test sales out of the boat show in Southampton. That's early October then, and, um, and it's Southampton, so um, we, we have some rain. And unfortunately, last year we had about two weeks, which every single day, 30 knots of wind, up to 40 knots of wind. Uh, I did about 19 test sales or something there and um, uh, and we talk with the customers do so you really want to go out you know Portsmouth is also a very busy harbor and, and lots lots of wave and tide situation outside so we start usually out in the cockpit all in, in full weather gear and life jackets and everything but if we are a bit out and have a bit of clear space then I usually say well how, how about going inside and we just switch on autopilot and then go in here and then people start to sit around there and, and the moment you close the door this 30 knots of wind suddenly feels like 15 mm -hmm. and um, and we have some sandwiches and something to drink and start to talk and, and then usually because somebody says well oh, person isn't it the the isle of wight coming up there so should we do a tag and you say well yeah makes sense <laughs> and the moment you have simply forgotten about what's outside if you open the door you're you're right surprised about well suddenly 30 knots of wind are back mm -hmm. and i mean you just mentioned tacking, right? And it has a self-tacking jib. Mm. And also, you can control the autopilot from in here. So if you have the jib out, then you could simply, you could tack from in here and without having to go outside, right? You could, yeah. I'm not sure if that really counts as sailing, but <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah, yes, it in does. In my book, it does. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes, it does. Of course, if you're outside and they want to trim the sails, and then you're out. Awesome. But that's fast and easy. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, and if you feel like it, you can still decide to be wet and cold and miserable outside. <laughs> but yes, for engine control or for under self tacking jib and tacking up, you can use the inside steering and you can either switch on the autopilot and have it steer the course and correct that, or you can switch on power steering, which is a different feature when you have a direct control of the boat. So the, the, as fast as you turn the uh, control switch, as fast the wheel is turning outside. You can literally wait in front of a bridge um, in pouring rain with 20 other boats doing circles and so sitting in here waving with your coffee pot. Um, <laughs> That's awesome. You want to be nasty. <laughs> and you also mentioned uh, being cold and miserable, right? And if you come in from outside, which is a feature I really appreciate too, you can just take off your foul weather gear and stuff it down there into that locker. On many other boats, you have to carry it you know, through the entire boat, say into the head or the shower or wherever and drip all over the floor. But here you just leave all the wet stuff right there, which is such an advantage in my mm. opinion. And you know what I also appreciate is all the areas where you can just hold on because in rough weather, you really don't want to be in an open wide boat 
they might be nice to look at and nice to stay in at a marina, mm -hmm. you know, because they feel like an apartment. <laughs> but if you're at sea, you just want to be able to hold on to places. And I mean, here, I, I can just do this, right? So assuming you come in from the outside and you hold on here and then you simply, you step down these two steps, you hold on here and you continue like so, you can hold on here. And assuming you, you're cooking something, you can lean against this wall or lean against the other one, hold on to this ledge and then cook here. It's so safe and you really don't need to be worried about flying around the boat if a big wave hits you. Right now I'm in the owner's cabin, which is right in the middle of the boat, which of course is perfect because you won't get any, well, you will get movements, but not as much as in the front or in an aft cabin. You will be relatively stable, so this is a safe place to sleep while on passage. And of course, you won't even need a TV. I mean, <laughs> look at that, right? <laughs> The wind has finally picked up, so we decide to head back outside to see how she performs. We're healing over quite a bit. What are we going to do about that? Well, it's fun, isn't it? I like it, <laughs> but maybe not everybody, so... Well, we have possibilities. Now we are on the big jenny and of course we can put the reefs in. Um, it's all single line reef, everything done from the cockpit. Um, but we also have a cutter stay with the self taking jib. Okay. Um, which is a nice sail if we want to tuck up here. Okay, so um, how are we going to do this? Are we going to get the Genoa in first or get the jib out and then get the Genoa in? Now that's a nice thing on this configuration. Uh, we can actually take the self-tacking jib out. Even if the wind comes from there, we can still take it out in the shadow of the streamline of the Jenny. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't need much force for it. And the moment you have the self-tacking jib tight, the Jenny starts to flap and then we can pull the jenny in totally in the shadow of the self-tacking jib again. Okay. That works quite good. The self-tacking jib really makes for single-handed sailing, as you won't have to touch a thing apart from your steering wheel. That was quite different from what I'm used to. So how many sails you had when you've done your big trip? Oh, we... We actually didn't have that many. We only had one main and uh, one furling Genoa. And then I think we also had a storm jib somewhere down in the cockpit locker, but we never ever used it. So yeah. that yeah. was all we did. It was very inefficient, but we were lazy, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you, Lisa had only one force day. Yeah, and, and but I know quite a few people who also had two force days and were very yeah. happy with it. And yeah. so. Do all of the boats that you have or that you produce have two force days or? Well, it's not mandatory, um, uh, but mo the majority of the boats have. Um, well, if, if we talk ocean passage, then some, sometimes you will, have, you will have just the possibility to have two sails, which you fly passage style yeah. with two big jennies on yeah. the side. Um, uh, most of these boats have a cutter stay um, with a self-tacking jib and the big jenny ahead. Um, I think one of the main reasons is the ease of handling, um, but also the possibility to do uh, to go from the biggest head sail from the big jenny to the small self taking jib, which also act as a storm sail in one and a half, two minutes without leaving the cockpit, mm -hmm. which is a safe thing. And of course, you don't lose any of the efficiency, unlike when you're rolling up a Genoa, it sort of loses its shape, right? Well, as, as a race, as kind of a race sailor or, or somebody, somebody who likes to sail fast, it's, it's just horrible. The idea to halfway for the Jenny, um, in an emergency everything is fine, that's for sure. But, but um, you know, a sail is, is reinforced on the three edges very, very massively. And if you only furl that two or three furls, you automatically um, stress the sail in two positions where it's not reinforced at all. And even if you don't see it, you destroy the shape of the sail literally in, in a few hours and you lose the performance then if you, if you want to fly it 
So, mm -hmm. so if, if any of our customers um, starts to halfway furl a Jenny and say, we'll sit, I will get very angry with him <laughs> because you have the self-tacking jib, which you can, can fully fly. And then, of course, I start to reef in the main if the wind goes stronger and stronger, either with a in-mast furling, which is a possibility, or the uh, in sing, single line reefing, mm -hmm. which I like. And yes, if 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 you if we then come to a full storm, um, you can you can make self taking zip smaller and furl it. But I would always furl it in tremendously and only have one and a half meter left standing. That's enough to get a good stream onto the main and enough to keep you safe mm -hmm. on a leeway without destroying the sail. Yeah. Okay. So you, ha you had an orange storm jib or something which you can hoist over the Jenny or? Yeah, yeah, one of those. Oh, but as I said, never used. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, lucky you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and any kind of cruising chute or spinnaker or power sailor or Code Zero? We had a spinnaker on board and we only used it once during that entire year. Okay. Because we always had very strong winds, like oh. usually above 20 knots. 30 knots up to 50 really. It's fantastic wind for, yeah. for a spinnaker, not 50 knots, yeah. <laughs> but, but 20. <laughs> but the spinnaker was pretty old so you really didn't want to you know put too much stress on it. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, and we thought about buying a parasailer but those are quite expensive and I would definitely consider buying one of those if you're gonna circumnavigate for a couple of years because I think then it really pays off. But for us, it was just one year, so we figured, hey, it's gonna, you know, it's gonna work out without, and it did. But at, you know, there were moments where I had hoped that we had yeah. a nicer, bigger sail that was stable that you could leave up at night because a spinnaker you wouldn't want to leave up at night on an Atlantic crossing. At least not if you're only two of you. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So and with a parasailer, you could definitely do that. Mm. And had you and you had. You had the, the, the Jenny to one side and, and, the, other and the main to the other on, on the Atlantic No, we had, had, had uh, two Genoa, so we had an old Genoa that we also found somewhere in the cockpit locker. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and we also pulled that up. Yeah. And then we used the spinnaker pole on one side and we yeah. used the boom from the main yeah. on the other side. Yeah. Fiddling to, it through the yeah, end of yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh. That's, that's easy. So, that's you know, you can make it work with yeah. old material, but of course, it's much nicer if you have new sails and fancy stuff. <laughs> <laughs> okay. well. While I see the advantages of a self tacking jib, if I were to order a Sirius, I would probably order it without the self tacking jib. Though, of course, Torsten would get angry at me for partly rolling in the Genoa and using it as a reefed head sail. For the sake of completeness, we also reef the main just to see how that works. This particular boat has a jiffy reefing system, which is a simple and effective system that is foolproof. While an in-mast furling system looks neater and the sail is nicely stored away, I have experienced that this can get stuck and you might not be able to get the sail in fully. So I am definitely a fan of the single line reefing system. Shaking it out is done just as quickly. When sailing around the world, keeping things simple is the way to go. This was a very fun and enlightening day sailing the Sirius 35DS. It matched and in a lot of cases exceeded my expectations in terms of ease of handling, seaworthiness, suitability for single-handed sailing and stability. Beforehand, I was a bit worried about the aft cockpit since I'm used to a center cockpit, but it felt just as safe and secure. This particular boat already has most of the equipment necessary for a circumnavigation. Add some wind steering and I'd be ready to go. As I've said before, I would probably pick a sail setup with a single headset, but 
that's just about the only downside I could find. When it is finally time to return to the marina, we simply roll in the headsail and then we drop the main into the stack packs. This is done within seconds and the sail is safely stored away after you close the zipper. By the way, this is probably the only 35 footer where I can reach the top of the boom. That roof does come in handy. When I did my first video of the 35DS, which is on my own YouTube channel by the way, I got a lot of people asking why I preferred the 35DS over the 40DS. Well, for me, it does seem like the perfect size if you're planning to circumnavigate alone or with your partner. Everything can be done without electric winches and so on, and the mass is low enough to be able to do the intracoastal waterway. I'm not tall, so I'm glad I can reach everything on this boat. But what's perfect for me might not be perfect for you. My feeling is that if you speak to Torsten, you will quickly find out what your ideal boat size would be. If you've enjoyed this video, make sure to give it a thumbs up. Leave us a comment if you have questions about the boats and we'll be happy to get back to you. Subscribe to our channel for more of our videos. And also, if you want to experience our boats firsthand, come and visit us in northern Germany or on various international boat shows. Thanks for watching and bye bye.